Hi, so I'm uh, Alex. I work at Telus Digital. A couple years ago, like two years ago, Telus decided to uh, re-architect all of its systems. So Telus is a, a Canadian telecom company, and uh, we provide, um, you know, cell phone and, and uh, home internet service, television, all that stuff. We have a fiber network, and. Uh, we realized that the way we built software was pretty old school. This is before my time. Uh, and we brought in a bunch of startup people and we gave them a bunch of money and said, can you please build your dream stack? Uh, so, I'm Alex. That's me. I'm the principal integration architect, which means I'm the API emperor. Uh, I just do whatever, <laughs> within, within the bounds of reason, I do kind of whatever I want to tell us. I, I define all of our API standards. Um, uh, digital is uh, B2C, we're the experience layer, we're focused on, um, uh, uh, if you, you know, download the TELUS app, we're the guys that built that. Um, there's a whole lot of complexity in the telecom stack, I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, this talk is an update to when I gave, it's just talking to Paul, like eight months ago. And uh, that talk was about... Uh, it was called the Enterprise Business Case for GraphQL. So uh, you saw uh, Paul earlier talk about um, his kind of hacking side project stuff. You saw Nathaniel just now talking about a really cool uh, kind of startup focused uh, use case. And then this is kind of magnifying out. So I'm talking about the kind of big business um, logic for why you want to use GraphQL for um, some of these, uh, some enterprise integration patterns. So. One of my key insights, I had two kind of major key insights, we'll get into them in a sec, my last talk. And it was that, so you saw with Paul's stuff earlier, um, and this is why I asked the question about Prisma, and if you could write custom, um, I don't want to say resolvers, but if you could write a custom layer for your backend. Because really what I want is, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time querying databases. My APIs don't really talk directly to systems of record. They talk to, other systems which are layered in between. So we have what's more, it's kind of a, a three-tiered architecture, but the tiers have massive complexity inside them. So I want something like Prisma, which lets me query arbitrary systems. And so this is the old talk. I'm just gonna go through a couple slides really quick to just baseline everything. So um, GraphQL allows queries of a mathematical graph, so nodes and edges. Um, this is my simplified enterprise architecture diagram. Any of you who have worked in enterprise might know how simplified this is. Uh, uh, but yeah, you have a client, you have a middle tier, you have your back end. So one of the key insights with GraphQL in the enterprise context is that um, that graph on the left, that's pretty close to what our back end looks like. We have a bunch of different systems. Uh, they're all connected to each other in arbitrary ways. And we want to be able to talk to, we want to be able to realize the physical architecture of our back end and then um, query it. Uh, 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 say a concrete example is we have to traverse about seven systems. Some really neat kind of practical use cases in telecom, right? So if you were to go home and take your, um, uh, your modem, like your, your uh, whatever's connected into your Wi-Fi access point, and give that to your neighbor and swap modems with them. Um, that ends up being a use case that I have to consider. So how do I assign, how do I detect that that modem serial number has now moved across what are called shelf ports in our fiber network? So you're now connected to a different port on our fiber network. You have uh, a piece of hardware which is allocated to a different customer, but because of that port switch, I now have to be cognizant of the fact that you're you know, billing a different account and all of that. So because our network is so flexible, um, uh, we end up, and, and also actually because we've grown through acquisition over the last 20, 30 years, right? We've bought something like 17 regional telecoms over 20 years. And uh, so we ended up with uh, somewhere between 17 and 22 billing systems. And the fact that I'm uncertain about the number of billing systems we had gives you a kind of an idea of our complexity. Um, but because our network is so highly configurable, uh, I end up having to, I can't maintain, for example, a simple mapping of your customer ID has this particular cable modem. Um, a lot of this data has to come from the live functioning of the network. 
So you see there that like the back end is actually this literal like mathematical graph, and the query language we use, uh, GraphQL is a useful query language for realizing that um, that graph. Like you build instead of just sharing around architecture diagrams of what, how you think the systems are connected, because these can change, you actually realize that architecture in a resolver, and then you ask the resolver questions. So I, you know, I say, uh, for this user ID, give me their current serial number. And there's a multi-system traversal, so you, it's, you know, it's, uh, it has to do with uh, DHCP records, which are cached in a certain uh, relational database, and then um, uh, the events uh, uh, that that fires off changes and that get cached in a different kind of Cassandra database somewhere and we gotta do aggregates on top of that to generate your customer record. So all of these things are really complex and we ended up, uh, we end up having quite a lot of software that has to talk to each other or talk to, um, everything's hyper-connected and we want ways to um, simplify that query. So the two key insights from the old thing, I, I have a cool kind of like burnt paper effect showing that this is the old talk, but it's lost in this light. Um, yeah, so GraphQL helps us um, isolate our technical debt. So the knowledge of how our systems are plugged together can actually be realized as code. You guys are probably familiar with the infrastructure as code um, uh, kind of concept. Uh, this is what we're trying to do. And the technical debt that we're isolating is, yeah, the knowledge of that enterprise backend, like how these things are plugged together. There's not a lot of ways there's not a lot of, there are a lot of ways of recombining them. There are not a lot of valid recombinations. There's a lot of complexity that you just have to kind of know. So if you're writing a new service, you have to know, oh, I need this thing over here. I'm not allowed to cache that other piece of data for legal reasons. So that was kind of my last talk. The graph is of our physical systems. So I just want to talk a little bit about logical versus physical architecture. This is kind of systems design 101. Do people know what I'm talking about when I say logical versus physical? I get a lot of blank stares in, in meetings when I, when I mention this, but yeah, so your logical is your kind of like platonic realm. It's like you define these like ideal forms and you plan your structure. And then it never really works out. What ends up happening is, so you, you, again, simplified logical diagram. I say I have a client that's gonna talk to a server and we're gonna you know, go to a data store. And then my physical architecture is, if you look, I'm, I'm realizing that, right? So the client in this case is going to be an iOS app. I'm talking to our customer API, and I have some kind of Cassandra backend. I've picked specific uh, physical implementations of those platonic ideals. The argumentum ad lapidum. So um, uh, the physical is annoying because it has to exist, essentially. It's, um, you, you run into a lot of complexity when you realize these like beautiful conceptual structures and you have to kind of uh, just kind of deal with it. And because of the pace of business, what you end up doing a lot is like people just plug together stuff that works. It's like there will be some kind of, um, I, I mentioned there's a lot of complexity in our back end. Usually what'll happen is someone will say, well, my buddy built that system, so he's just going to give me a backdoor and you end up with a point-to-point con uh, point -point connection instead of what should go through our proper message bus, things like that. And so you end up with this, uh, we, we plan a garden and then we grow a jungle and we try to prune it back. And I'm, I'm banking that GraphQL is going to be one of the tools that lets us prune that back over time. So there was recently some Twitter shade thrown on GraphQL. Uh, these guys were talking about some of this. Um, it's not as simple, obviously, everyone here knows it's not as simple as, oh, it's just JSON developers, or JavaScript developers don't know how to write JSON endpoints, JSON kind of queries, and then expose them. This is really funny. Um, so let's kind of look at the physical architecture for a sec. So, yeah, I mean, kind of cool story. If this was as simple as the physical architecture actually stayed, uh, that would be true, but actually we, you know, our customer API has a couple of different data sources that it aggregates. And we have an ESB, so we do a lot of stuff with um, our service-oriented architecture. Is like, uh, I had this problem once, I was like, uh, so I want to allow, say like my kids to log into my home account so that they can configure 
whatever billing for no they wouldn't configure billing but you know they could order TV shows or something um, so the, I, I asked our enterprise architecture team like where does that where do I persist that data? And they said, oh, you, under no circumstances, persist that anywhere. What you do is you blast a message out on the ESB saying, this event has happened within our architecture, please handle it. And there's a bunch of listeners on that thing. It's like a big, giant message queue that's blasting stuff back and forth. And you've got to um, notify every system, because every system might have an opinion. Uh, a lot of this is managing, if you guys know Conway's law, I'm just going to gloss over it. But a lot of this is managing Conway's law. Um, the software you build is the, a reflection of your org chart. And then, as always, because we're a Canadian company, we have uh, the Quebec stack. So not only, not only do we have to do all of this for, um, for, for the Canadian stack, the national stack. Uh, the, Quebec, the Quebec guys call us the national stack. I call us the Anglo stack because I try to keep us on a parity. But uh, there's a whole French stack for they use different customer they did they did something interesting they just prepended a number um, not a bit field though to our uh, uh, our customer identifier so we have this whole it's like our our customer identifiers are nine digits long unless the person's in Quebec in which case they're ten digits long so there's this is what I mean about some of the complexity there's just we don't have a lot of um, consistency in our underlying data models oh yeah 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 and then all of these things take different times to come back so if you wait for customer API to aggregate the slowest response, then it will always be the, it, you know, it's, it's as slow as the, um, to mix my metaphors, it's as slow as the weakest link in the chain. You've got to wait for all of these things to come back. So, you know, there's ways to deal with that. I'm going to talk, but this is, this is the desert of the real. This is, you know, we've, we've existed for so long in this platonic realm, and now we've, we've built this beautiful design, and then we try to actually implement this and you run into massive, massive complexity. So I just want to quickly talk about a customer API, and I'll get into some of the ways that you can play around with this uh, and where graph applies. So yeah, this is what we're talking about. That's the actual, I pulled this earlier this today, like this was this afternoon. So this is a mapping from our, um, one of our live logging systems of, uh, on the left are, uh, JSON or JavaScript APIs that aggregate what are basically all um, <coughs> Java services running in a bunch of different ways um, on the on the right, and uh, um, this is one page of three, I think. Um, and this animates in the live version, so you can click on one of these, and it'll show you all the downstreams it calls. So this is a giant big spaghetti mess. Customer API serves over 1.5 million a day. It was 1.5 million this week when I checked. Uh, it gets as high as two and a half million. And this is just anytime you are logged in or you're trying to like look at the app or anything like that, we serve a bunch of information about you to the to the experience. <coughs> so yeah, getting around. Um, there's, there's kind of like a couple of different uh, entities within Customer API. And we can get around um, that that like weakest link in the chain problem I was just talking about with Hados. For a long time, I was just kind of like, cool story, rest. Um, Hados is this like neat feature, but um, why would I ever use it? And then when I started working in enterprise, I was like, oh, I see. Like, all of these systems behave strangely. And you can kind of say, you know what? I never want to talk to that thing. Just give me the response. Don't bother composing it for me. So yeah, you, you know, Hados, for those not in the know, um, you just kind of say, for each of these entities, here's how you would query it. You can return whatever you want here. And then, obviously, GraphQL. So there's an issue here. This is kind of neat. So for the client, the client has to know to ask for these things and has to kind of know how to do that join that Nathaniel was talking about a little bit. It has to know kind of... Um, what's a good example? Like, if there are multiple profiles on the account, a profile is like, uh, you know, if I have, you know... Um, if my wife is the account holder, I might be a profile on her account. Um, so I can log in without her kind of having to share her password with me. So there might be some kind of multiple objects that you have under that. And you have to kind of then do the Hados links for those. So like it, you end up wanting to have APIs that do composition so you're not doing it on the front end because it's kind of just architecturally inelegant to do on the front end. Um, yeah. And the cool, one of the, I guess the coolest thing, as we all know about GraphQL, is that 
it does let the clients kind of control their own tech debt. They just kind of say, hey, give me the customer name. And then we can swap around our back end and do all this, you know, resolve for different ways of shuffling our back end without having to update the clients. And it does like payload filtering and all of that. One of the kind of neat things that Telus does is um, um, if you are using if you were using a Telus app on a Telus phone, you don't have to be using a Telus phone, I guess, but if you're using a Telus app on the Telus network, uh, we don't charge you for the data. So we want to, being greedy capitalists, we want to like shave those payloads down so that we send you the minimum possible kind of stuff. It's good for your battery and stuff too. So yeah, so obviously GraphQL, it's kind of, it's a little less verbose. So back to these two things. So we can isolate our technical debt. Yeah, we're isolating knowledge of the back end. Um, but so as I mentioned, like the first time I gave, the first time I was talking about these things here, it was like eight months ago. And I actually gave one of the best software estimates I've ever given in my career. Like, you know, never, never promise deliverables at a particular time, right? But I, I kind of said, oh, you know, yeah, this graph stuff, that's cool. We'll probably be working on it in Q4. And so here we are, the fourth quarter, and we are beginning our GraphQL implementation. However, I waited too long. So this is one of my, this is again another slide from the original uh, presentation. I was asked to not say that we disrupt Big Telus, but I left it up there, whatever. Um, it's not serious, it's jokes, everyone loves each other. Um, the enterprise tech adoption cycle. So. One of the things that you run into when you're playing with new stuff is like enterprises really wait until things are well sorted before they, uh, before they jump in. Um, banks take quite a long time. Mining is huge. Mining, like, they're just beginning to get into using computers for stuff. And uh, uh, telecom is usually fast. So I kind of said, you know, GraphQL 2016, we're going to see wider uptake starting around five years out, and uh, you know you're going to be able to get like bleeding edge jobs in enterprise in like three years. It turns out that this was just totally wrong. <laughs> uh, in the in the eight months since I gave my last talk, um, they snuck up on me. They kind of <laughs> I just like this image, but yeah, they kind of snuck up and they they surprised me and they uh, they started doing the revolution without me. The revolution did not wait, so that's why this talk. Uh, it's called GraphQL brush fires. Uh, I'm coming to the last kind of like third of the slides. We're almost done. Um, I just want to talk about uh, Telus is a we're pretty f uh, like future forward, and uh, um, we ran into a couple of interesting use cases. Again, like uh, uh, you know, Paul was talking about uh, you know how you can quickly prototype these things, and Nathaniel was saying, oh, there's this cool like way we can do remote loading. Um, some of the, here's some of the stuff that I'm running into that's um, kind of the day-to-day -day in enterprise. So first of all, um, the vendor that ships the control system for our fiber stack shipped a GraphQL API, a graph, Q, graph endpoint with functional parity to the REST surface, the REST API surface. So that means that and I'm trying to sound cool, I call this glass to glass. So it's the glass of your phone can now control the glass in the ground. Um, so the apps that we make, the web you know, experiences we do, can now directly configure uh, our fiber stack. Um, I think you can imagine some cool stuff that we could do there. Um, the immediate kind of use cases are just simply like, um, we don't really operate here for commercial. We operate more in, in Vancouver. We do some business stuff here. But imagine if TELUS were to roll out uh, home internet here and you guys could, could use it. You could do things like hop on the TELUS app and provision more bandwidth for when you had a party and you wanted to like, you know, just, just for the next three hours, I'd like to allocate more bandwidth to my house, please. So there's some stuff there that's really cool that we can, you know, that this is enabling us to do. This is, I maybe buried the lead. Uh, this is kind of a present for the people who stuck around. Um, we have a really great machine learning team. Um, the way that our machine learning practice works, so 
So we, we do a lot of work directly with Google on uh, rationalizing our data models. And we use a, um, a columnar store. So like we don't actually store tables of data. We store individual uh, columns. And then each column has an index. So every kind of every table that we would look at is actually just two columns, the index, and then whatever you're indexing. And so there's three major use cases for GraphQL within our machine learning practice. This is really cool. So on the input side, you have all these columns. You can kind of, it's not exactly on the fly, but you can kind of compose whatever view of the data you want using GraphQL. You can just say, give me these columns. Um, yeah, and we, we have huge amounts of data that, that we can kind of slice and dice using this method. We call this our data platform. And we're, what we're trying to do, um, so what my team does is we build, we kind of build the tools with which TELUS goes after um, um, problems. So we're, we're a platform team within the company. So we call this our data platform. And the idea here is that um, someone who's working on a machine learning problem in TELUS Digital can uh, slice and dice data however they want, and it's all of our corporate data. It's not quite there. Um, um, there's a lot of, we have um, some really interesting problems around um, um, privacy legislation. Like, um, first of all, we have to make sure that all of the data, no matter how you slice it, is properly cognizant of privacy. And then we have kind of neat problems, like if you combine column one and column three, or column A and column you know, Q of something, does the combination of those bleed private information? So you have to do, it's kind of like a graph coloring problem to, to determine the security and privacy characteristics of how we chop up this data. Again, like the mathematical theory behind graphs kind of comes right into this stuff. So yeah, input model composition on the fly. Um, I'm going to talk about output first. So. Uh, if a machine learning model generates a, uh, uh, discovers a feature, it can be exposed to the front end as fast as we have front end time to ask for it, right? Like you add it to the schema, you add it to your query, and you get it in the front end. There's not like the normal kind of like iteration cycle for machine learning stuff is, um, you know, you'd, you'd train a model, it would figure out a feature, then you'd like give it to an API team, that API team would like spend a bunch of time like building some wrapper around it, making sure all the back end connections are good, and then uh, exposing that to the front end. You got a front end integration, that integration cycle. Uh, by using GraphQL for this stuff, we expose it much more quickly. We, ha we can expose it much more quick quickly. It's kind of like this stuff here with the fiber stack. It's like, what is possible here? The, the, the doors we're opening are really interesting. We haven't um, elected to go through any of them yet. The really fascinating thing is the, the internal model decomposition. So when you have a bunch of really complex machine learning models, um, you don't really want like big, um, you kind of run into the same stuff that we would normally do in software engineering anyway, right? Like you don't want um, uh, monolithic development even in your machine learning stuff. Like if you have you know, if you have a big slush pile of, of linear algebra, you kind of want to decompose it so that it, um, is, uh, uh, the models are solving the smallest possible problem and then recompose those into kind of your larger problem. Same as anything you want to decompose a problem as you're solving it, right? So um, GraphQL is something that we're using within our machine learning practice to, um, um, yeah, like allow decomposition of problems into kind of sub models and then recombining those. And then yeah, the simplest one actually, customer API. So um, I, I mentioned with our data platform that we're slicing and dicing data pretty finely. We have these columnar stores. Um, Kat, this is user. This, this is why we need to like wrangle those guys. But um, yeah, we don't want, we, <laughs> There's no reason that someone showing up as a front-end engineer uh, in, in TELUS Digital on day one needs to like, start learning our enterprise architecture. Just like ask for the customer's name and we'll figure out how to get it for you. 
Um, the same thing here, like add it to your request and uh, you, you, you get some of this data. You see some of this like complexity that we're dealing with here. Like I want to iron this out as much as possible so that the new guys just don't have to worry about it. Yeah, so these are three, okay, so <laughs> these are three teams within TELUS that implemented GraphQL without talking to me. Um, uh, not without talking to me, I mean, I wrote this talk, like they eventually told me they were doing it, but um, so this is kind of like the revolution that I was planning in my previous talk is happening without me. And uh, so yeah, remote loading, I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> this originally said uh, schema stitching, but I, I ran and changed it. It's, uh, you know, the architect will strike back. Um, all of these right now are unique um, endpoints, and I do want to have one that kind of, to mix my movies, one that unites them all. One to rule them all. So come work with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>